Hi, I'm Anita Walker, and welcome to this week's Culture Check. We took a week off last week as we were celebrating the UP Awards, which, as many of you know, are all about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how we can improve our ability to reach out to audiences that typically would not find themselves in our cultural organization. Well, speaking about our organizations, our meeting the moment, we were delighted to have with us today Jerry Beck of Artspace Maynard, Corrali Rivera, of the Revolving Museum, and Darren Wells, an award-winning teacher at Boston's Timothy Middle School. Jerry and Corrali joined forces this spring to create the Corona Crown Project, a bilingual mobile art project designed to encourage communities hard hit by the coronavirus. After visiting Boston, Chelsea, Lawrence, Richburg, and other towns during the height of the virus this week, they with Darren to pivot. To, approach, to focus actually on on one of an issue of anti-racism. Um, as you know, we are all absolutely deeply, deeply moved, angered, outraged um, with the murder of George Floyd. National protests continue, sustained, continued protest against uh, police brutality and racism in America. Uh, but this project is really looking at the impetus of what we all can do as cultural organizations, how we can harness the power of culture to address this legacy of racism that seems stuck in our country. Jerry, Corrali, and Darren, thank you very much for being with us on the Culture Chat today. I stumble around because the minute I start talking about this issue, it's, it's, it's so painful for so many uh, in this country. And hopefully we're finally at a moment where we can turn the corner and real really make real change. Um, before we get started on the project, however, Jerry and Corrali, talk a little about your organizations. Corrali, first, what's the Revolving Museum? Well, first of all, thank you for having us, and uh, it is a pleasure to talk to, to you this morning. Um, the Revolving Museum has been um, around for about 35, 36 years. It's a community arts organization that focuses on on you know developing uh, under utilized uh, spaces and inviting community um, of all backgrounds to collaborate uh, and create uh, art and uh, respond to different um, to different situations. So uh, we have been uh, very interested in current issues and we continue to to try to respond to everything that's happening around the world. So we go to many places, meet many people. We uh, we work in schools and different um, different areas. Jerry, um, I want to hear a little bit about Maynard, but also as you talk about what's happening at Art Space, one of the one of the barriers I think to confronting the issue is the fact that our superpower is bringing people together, and I mean physically together in one space to make art together, to be in an art space together. Um, so talk about your project and um, how the uh, art space in Maynard uh, participated. Well, you know, I, I kind of uh, was so thrilled to have people reach out from Maynard to ask me to apply for that job for, as the executive director. I was celebrating the 35th year of the Revolve Museum, which was, uh, of course, a high point. We had a, a poetry mobile that traveled all over New England, presenting over 500 poems from the diverse community. And before that, you know, the Revolve Museum created the world's largest paper airplane, um, which was 5,000 plus people making it, breaking a German world record. and. Uh, kind of discussing the, uh, the importance of aviation and art and learning and so forth. But um, the one place that, that really got me interested in which I applied for was Art Space Maynard. And I was there at the opening about 20 years ago, came out from Four Point, that's where Revolve Museum was. And um, I was very inspired by the, the old school building. I was inspired by how the town uh, donated the building or a dollar um, for the building to really create an important art center and studio program for the town. Um, and since that point, of course, I've gone to many open studios and had many friends that had studios there. And of course, seeing downtown Maynard, this real charming mill town, very small community, 10,000 plus people. I really thought it was time for a change because I wanted to work again with artists 
and community and the town. And they had just got their designation for a cult as a cultural district from the state, which you knew about. And so I just felt the timing is now. And I knew uh, Corrali would be a great director, very much the same vision that I had and actually expanded it because she was really interested in uh, doing a lot of her own vision uh, with community members. So I took the job and I tell you, it's been a, uh, it's been a blessing and that already we have made a profound impact. We've got all the artists at Artspace involved. We're working with the town on multiple projects. And, and what was really interesting, even though Corrali and I have been uh, together for over 10 years, it's the first time that both of these organizations have collaborated on responding to the Corona Crown Project in which we knew we had the big head uh, which we've had for a long time, made by Bob Harmon, uh, one of the founders of the Revolve Museum. And so we thought, let's join forces and respond to this. And we came up with the Corona Crown Project, which as you know, has had a profound impact, especially when we went into uh, Chelsea. Chelsea and Lawrence and drove around. I mean, uh, we've been very fortunate that that happened. And so, you know, now we have doubled our participation because that project we had over almost 200 people uh, be involved in the Corona Crown project a few weeks ago and then all of a sudden we had to deal with this really uh, horrific uh, murder and um, we knew immediately that the Revolve Museum and Art Space Maynard were going to be very much about the creative process responding to the moment and that's the kind of culture we're in now, world culture. So that's what we're doing. So um, I want to keep talking a little bit about uh, both phases of this project as one thing slams into our world after another. But we do have some video um, of the driving around art museum. And this is where um, we've all had to figure out, well, we're not going to stop reaching audiences. We're not going to have walk away from art as an opportunity to illuminate and enrich and stimulate conversation, but we can't have people coming into our museums. We can't get together. So we're looking at some uh, video now and tell us what we're seeing. All right. Um, is it on there now? Okay. Well, what you're seeing is the, uh, the first day, our first, uh, this is with the premiere of it and we're in right near our home where we built it and uh, we've got a lot of neighbors interested in Maynard Art Space and the Revolving Museum. Of course a lot of people is a very tight-knit neighborhood and uh, so this is us ready to go down to Boston and uh, very excited. We got the crown on there that represents really the real heroes or the people that are saving lives out there and so there's the art mobile and then the uh, the one, the truck, which has got poetry on it, you'll see that, because we really like the idea of all the arts coming together in one piece, and that's kind of what we are doing together through Art Space and through the Revolve Museum. And there it goes, down to Boston. And you know, it's, I can't tell you, Anita, I wish you were with us, because when you see it driving down the street, whether it's on the highway or back roads, it, draws people's attention and it's kind of like being in a parade uh, all the time and um, that really warms my heart because see when you see you know as an artist you want to see emotion right and I can't tell you the amount of emotion that we've been able to experience during our journey with these two artmobiles it has been a profound experience life-changing experience because I know now at these moments, public art could really have, really be a catalyst for change, which is what I've always believed. But it's really during times which are controversial and could be world changing, or at least getting the attention through social media, that we can really make a difference. Corrali, can you talk a little bit about some of the reaction that you received, some maybe surprising or some stories that where this really had a profound impact on people. Well, you know, there were so many reactions uh, wherever we went. And I'll never forget uh, driving through some of the uh, residential streets in Chelsea 
and you know, the children playing maybe in a park and all of a sudden they see this big head and they start jumping up and down like, mom, and then they start going back into the house, calling their mom and dad and to come out and see the big head. And um, so that image I'll never forget. I'll, I'll also uh, never forget people trying to raise us down the highway so that they could park on the side and then take a photo of us coming. Video. People would do that. They would drive way ahead, get out of their cars and, <laughs> and videotape it. So it's out there on social media. People honking, just really putting their, you know, their excitement into, yes, you know, we need to support each other in, in you know, in keeping this uh, safety. Um, you know, and the art piece, and people say, oh, how beautiful it is, and it's very, it looks, it, it looks very, like, grassroots uh, kind of a thing, and people love it. So, um, you, before we move on to this, the second phase, and the second, literally, uh, unbelievable calamity that struck our nation with the murder of George Floyd, I do want to um, speak to so many people who have joined us in this conversation today. I think they just want to see that thing driving around, but, um, um, if you have any questions or comments or stories to share or anything you want to be part of this conversation, we want you to be part of the conversation. So just go down to your bottom of your laptop where it says um, there's a Q&A button and you push that Q&A button and you can send us a question, you can send us a story, uh, really join in because I think that's really what art stimulates is conversation. And my goodness, there's so much to talk about. Um, I want to bring Darren Wells into the conversation because we're in the middle of the pandemic. People are socially isolated. People are struggling at home, huge stress and anxiety. You bring this beautiful piece of art onto the streets of so many communities. And then the next thing we know, um, we're slammed again with the murder of George Floyd. There is an outpouring of anger, of rage. The protests continue. And you know that it's time to address this with art as well. So tell us how that happened. You want to start, Jerry? Oh, sure. Yeah. So um, two of our uh, most influential board members, Jose Gonzalez. Oh, there's Darren. Darren, are you there? Yeah, me. Yeah, I'm yeah. trying to right. navigate you. Yeah. How are you doing? Did you hear the question? I did. I did. Okay, go ahead then. So, so but, let's see, we have this double grab. I'm trying to get it back. All right, so basically the situation in it is just very simple. Uh, when Jerry contacted me, it was more like a call to action. Jerry and I are both long, long-term friends, and we share two beautiful people like our children. Well, the godfathers are two remarkable people. One is a board member, and the other is a long-time um, love of Jerry. And he asked the question. He says, I need your help, and we have to do something. And so in call to action, I serve on many, many different boards, as he's aware of. So currently, I'm an educator with Boston Public Schools, a science teacher. But I deal with a whole bunch of other concerns as it deals with being a person of color, definitely Black. Because in America, the, the biggest challenge that most people don't realize is that when you come to America, you're immediately put into two unique groups. You're either white or you're going to be treated black. And people who come to America don't quite understand why is that. And so it takes a long time for you to get people who you work with, to go to gym with, you go to the church with, to kind of understand what it means to be an American. And so oftentimes there's a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, but there's a lot of silence. And I think what's happening right now is people are breaking silence and they're having uncomfortable conversations in spaces and places that are not comfortable and they don't need to be comfortable. So um, when we talk about what's gonna come and, and what needs to happen, we all need to remain uncomfortable till we get to a space of comfort and then we still need to understand how do we maintain this. So could talk a little bit about the role of the arts. How can culture and the arts um, amplify and accelerate this conversation so that we can really see change. Because art evokes a thought process and you might see something that I don't see and I see something that you don't see. Now certain things are right in front of your face. Writing is always right in front of your face. 
but visual art is not. So when you read something, in and of itself, in and of itself it has a message. That message is usually very, very clear. To 70, 80%, most of us walk away with the same message. 30% might come back with something different, but most of us do. But art in and of itself doesn't do that. Art evokes the ability to have different experiences because we come from different places, different walks, and different ideologies. So art in and of itself is both subliminal and it's very, very in your face. So the powerful thing about art is it makes you stop, see, think, and wonder. And it actually makes you be self-reflective. It's All not suggesting, as you were saying, writing hands you the answer. You actually do have to look deep inside your own soul to find it. And oftentimes, art, abstract art does it very well. Because you're constantly trying to ask yourself, what was the artist trying to evoke in us as a thought? That's abstract art. But art that's very, very simple, art that children do, art that people learn how to first start drawing, those people can immediately get an idea where the artist was trying to take us. But when you're trying to give a message with art, uh, usually people who have no idea what's going on, when they see black and they see white in context, they begin to ask, does this have anything to do with race? So in America, when you see two, just two colors, black and white, and you throw it somewhere, people immediately say, does this have something to do with race? Jerry, so talk about how you managed to pivot this program. Jerry, unmute. I know we, we oh, are. Yeah. Are we back? Yes. Yes. All right. Well, you know, when you work as a public artist for a long time, you learn how to be spontaneous. You learn that the elements, the ingredients of your creative process engages the whole, everything around you. So you have to learn how to improvise quickly and you have to learn how to communicate quickly. And, you, and it really does challenge you, um, all your emotions and artistic experiences to respond. And we've had to do that for a long time. And uh, when, when this happened, I ended up calling as many people as I can and talk to as many people as I can, um, and especially Corrali, uh, because she's been leading this, this process um, through her own background, um, and working with multicultural, as a multicultural educator. So we ended up calling Jose and Becky first, and, and then we realized that we really needed to, uh, it just came to me, because Darren and I have known each other for a long time, and we, we've, in some ways, we've been wanting to collaborate for years, 20 years maybe plus, we've known each right. other. So all of a sudden, Darren popped in and I called him immediately and I said, Darren, it's time to work together now. And he was like, yep, I, I feel it. So we, we both had this kind of transformative moment where we knew we needed to join forces finally. Uh, and this is the moment now that we are doing it with Darren taking the lead involving his granddaughter, um, Ariana as well and the Revolve Museum and Art Space Maining supporting him and uh, his group of leaders that he's worked with. So that's how it happens. It happens quick, luckily for us. But you know, now we still got to design, redesign the whole Corona, uh, Corona Art Mobile, Corona Crown Project through his guidance and through his community, which we embrace. That's what it's all about, collaboration and letting different people lead at different times. We have one question that has come in from actually one of our colleagues, Luis Cotto. Um, and this is for you, Corrali. How was Spanish or other languages incorporated into the project, if at all, and also into the poetry? Yes, um, we, we opened the, uh, the uh, prompt to get people involved in submitting poetry that related to, uh, you know, uh, to their lives and, uh, 
especially when we're talking to students and to community members. And um, we had um, an artist from New York who, who had uh, submitted some, um, some poetry and uh, we wanted to uh, have a variety of people contribute uh, uh, their thoughts and reflections on to the current event. And so we, we decided that we were going to also look into our very own, um, you know, famous, you know, female, for example, um, authors like we had uh, Julia Alvarez from Dominican Republic and uh, we wanted to also use people that uh, would, that's, that the public would recognize, right? And Julia de Burgos from Puerto Rico, we found some really great quotes that we wanted people to, uh, to, to make them feel like, you know, their own. So we used um, three or four different artists that, uh, and poets that we recognize and we invited, and then we translate, we, we put their uh, quotes on the art mobiles. And um, we also do the translation for people to see it in English. So we had multiple um, languages, not just English and Spanish for the moment, but, um, we're always inviting people to submit, you know, words that would be of encouragement to everybody else. Yeah, and communication's key in our multicultural, um, and Corrali, her students that were very involved when the Raval Museum was in Fitchburg, they come from, you know, like they were 40, 40 different countries from different, you know, every kind of background, Asian, African-American, Latino, Native American. So, um, you know, how do you communicate with as much diversity as possible? And, and I think there's a lot of people, especially in Chelsea and, and Lawrence and other towns in Fitchburg and so forth, that is a huge population of Spanish speakers. So we felt we needed to try to respond in those settings, in those situations, so they feel supported. Darren, I want to bring you back into the conversation. What is okay. your vision? What is your hope and dream um, for this project and what it can do? Okay, so when you go to the doctor, the doctor asks you, if you could put pain on a scale from zero to 10, what are you experiencing? Well, if it's a toothache or if it's something that you've really been dealing with for quite some time, it's easy for you to say nine or 10. So I want to be able to address pain. And so the overarching thing is I would like the pain to get as close to zero as possible. Because right now we live in America where we're experiencing a huge amount of pain. For the, so, so, the, so when we look at this project, if I could walk around and say, well, what are you experiencing from zero to 10? I would like that number to be as low as possible. So I want everyone, all my colleagues, both white and black and everyone in between, to be able to breathe a sense of relief to know that this is not of all the problems that we have to deal with. Homelessness, um, people not being properly fed, um, just a, a number of challenges that we all face day to day. This should not be it. This, this situation called race in America should not be the problem. We have other things to be concerned about in this country and in this world. You know, COVID is definitely one right now, but we have global warming. So the answer to the question is, I really, really would like to have this eradicated because this should not be at this point in time, our concern. We should be focusing on something totally different. So I want to remove the pain. Aaron, yeah. you work in the Boston Public Schools. Um, mm -hmm. How are you thinking about the young people? First of all, who feel rach racial prejudice every single day in their lives, and now being isolated in their home, being away from um, their, their friends, um, uncertainty about what the path is ahead, this whole, this whole merging of COVID and racial justice at the same time, how are you thinking about the young people? So I would say, first and foremost, that's a huge misconception. So when we talk about children, when we were all very, very young and we all played in our playground and we were in kindergarten and first grade and usually second grade, a lot of us had no clue that we were different. 
The only time you start really understanding that there's different when you look at the front of your hand and the back of your hand. But other than that, a lot of your friends are your friends. You just, you just don't experience it when you're young. It's as we move up into the different phases of development, that's when we start recognizing, oh, we are different. So, you know, I would beg the argument that my children are really suffering in regards to race challenges because I don't have any white students. I don't really have any Asian students. I have all brown and black students. So they don't really have the same impact because I don't teach at Boston Latin Academy. I don't teach at John D. O'Brien. I don't teach at Latin Academy. I teach in an inner city school where for the most part, a lot of us don't service the other group. But what I will say is that there are experiences that they have and then we have to have conversations. So as we move to other communities, you know, it's the fact of language, it's the factor of dark skin, light skin. Those are things that unfortunately are, pre are prevailing in many, many communities. But the reality is the students are really feeling the pain of the adults. And that's where we have to address. The students recognize that something just happened with the emote between the adult in my life and me. And the child begins to realize mom and dad are responding differently because of something that's going on. And so the response from where I stand is not really with the children, especially the young one. The response are primarily with the, um, the effect and affect of what happens to adults in their lives. We have another question. This from, again, one of my colleagues, Jay Paget. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on mentoring young artists to find their voices in these painful times? And, and um, Corrali, maybe you can address that. Um, okay. Oh, go, Corrali. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question well. The question was, do you have any thoughts on mentoring young artists to find their voices in these yeah. painful times? Well, um, of course, I mean, as you, as you can imagine, working with children uh, for many years, I, I have found that the arts uh, are a way for expression in, in ways that, you know, are not typical in many classrooms. So through, um, through motivating kids into joining our, you know, our, our programs and joining our projects, I, we find that kids uh, reflect and see the importance of, you know, their voices, that their voices matter and, you know, what, what it means to come together, even though we can't do it, uh, we have to do it at a distance, but to come together and something bigger than what they ever thought of. You know, and and collaborate into um, in, into a powerful um, vision that will impact many more people. Jerry, I'm going to give you a question that's just come in from a an anonymous attendee. Um, as an arts and cultural organization, do you have any word of advice for other organizations on how to engage and work with other sectors, such as the public schools, health workers, etc., in order to address these crises, but also raising the banner of arts and culture? Well, yeah. Well, I, you know, from the very beginning, um, I've always felt the the big mis the misconnection between our Western thinking of art versus traditional original cultures is that. Um, art should be a part of our everyday life. So the whole reason why I wanted to be an artist was to be able to engage the broad public in that we all started, and, and I think Darren was mentioning this, we all started as creative beings when we were young. We worked together, we collaborated, we made tree houses, we created theater, we made, you know, we did, now you see the graffiti being put up by amazing amount of diversity at young ages. So I, we, the Revolve Museum has never said no to anybody in our entire 36 year history. Um, and I continue to, to do that kind of work, inviting the public to participate in projects on their own terms, just by encouragement. I absolutely believe the revolution that we need to do, especially in the arts, is to believe that there shouldn't be an audience. We should invite people to actually engage in the creative process and enjoy their own creativity that they have naturally, that they don't see as artistic or creative, but we all have it. So part of our communication is education 
educationally driven and then really kind of artists need to be out there in the community not just be you know talking to people in museums and that hierarchy of traditional museum culture but really the the common ground that art can be part of our everyday life everybody has talent we can work together and to me the arts could be this probably the biggest way to revolutionize our world. I mean, there's political leaders, but I'm telling you, I believe this, that art can change the world. And I've seen it happen by just changing us individually. So to me, we have to really look at the public as our partners and, and invite them to the table and do everything possible to convince them that it could be fun and help change the world, no matter what the subject is. So that's our agenda, is that uh, the creative revolution is now and it deals with every political, environmental, social issue there is. And holistically, art is the thing that can bind us. Art and science, I think, are two of the primary things that can change the world. And I always feel that's, that's the way to, to look at it, is let's get everybody involved, and especially with public arts power to use the social media, let's get it out there and do everything we can creatively to, to make a statement and build community can't imagine more powerful, more potent, and more true words that you have just spoken, Jerry. And what a great summation of the work that you're doing. And um, all of you, I, I, I sit in awe of your work, of your ability, of your nimbleness, and your embrace of um, the possibilities of the creative work. Uh, Darren, thank you so much for sharing and for helping us learn and understand. Corrali, thank you for being here. And Jerry, again, thank you for pulling all of us together for this amazing conversation. Well, thank, thank you. you for your and work. Onward, onward to the right. creative realm. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye-bye, okay. everybody. Take care.